Okay, we'll begin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alladhi anzal Qur'an huda linnasi wa alamnahu wa zakkayna bihi wa arsala al-nabiya al-mu'alim al-habib al-a'zam Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam liyubayi lana al-ayat li'annahu sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam akhlaquhu Qur'an fama abyana wa awdaha li ma'ani al-Qur'an min sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Muntajim al-Qur'an bilisanihi al-Sharif wa akhlaqi al-Sharif wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim Nawaina bidirasatina li tafsir ayat al-Qur'an Munajid Allah Ta'ala wa istikhraj al-Ulam al-Qur'an Wa ti'adha bi kalam Allah Ta'ala wa tumi'nana bihi Wa ziyad al-Iman wa tanwir al-Qulubina wa sharh sudurana Wa bitigha al-Ujuri wa thawab wa husun al-Ridwan Min al-Rahman wa dukhul fi ahlina wa khawasatihi Wa ghufran al-Zunub wa shifa fi ajsalina wa qulubina Wa silaha ahlina wa awladina Wa silaha al-Muslimin wa nawayna man nawahu al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa salaf al-Sawlih Jalan ini dan jenazah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi fi kullahdin abada ala la ni'mani wa afdalihi Allahumma atina min ladunka rahma wa alimna min ladunka ilma subhanaka la ilmana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim نويت تعلم وتعليم المذكرة وتذكير النفع والانتفاع ونفادة والاستفادة والحث نتمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضى به وقرب الطاب سبحانه وتعالى مع لطف وعافة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم ألهمنا علما نفقه بأوامرك ونواهيك وارزقنا فهما نعرف به كيف ناجيك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نسألك فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين وإلهم الملائكة المقربين في عافية يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أغنا بالعلم وزينا بالحلم وأكرنا بالتقوى وجملنا بالعافية يا أرحم الراحمين آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم إنا نستودعك ما قرأناه وما نقرأه في هذا المجلس وما قبله وما بعده فاحفظه علينا حتى ترده إلينا وقت احتياجنا إليه يا أرحم الراحم اللهم أكرم بنور الفهم وأخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وافتح لنا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا حكمتك يا أرحم الراحم آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم يا مقاليد الأمور كلها ويؤبيده وإليه يرجع الأمور كلها يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم افتح علينا فتحا قريبا صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل أقل من سني فقه قولي وسد لساني وهدي قلبي وفعل كذلك بأحبابي أبدا وارزقنا كمال الفتوح العارف والفقه في الدين مع الكمال إخلاص الصدق اليقين والعافية والغنى والنسر وحفظ النفع والدفاع وخيرات الدارين وعلوم الأول والآخر آمين صلى الله عليه وسلم وحمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الفاتحة Okay, Alhamdulillah. Know that everybody is in it, or is it three of you? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. 
whenever the class size is uh, small, it's actually like good news because it's like more angels can fit inside the room. <laughs> like it's filled up with the other beings <laughs> who have come to listen. There was a there was a cat once when I was in the in Darimla that she would always come and sit if our in our classes if our Maryam. And her Maryam uh there was once that she just like said, You all know it's not a cat, right? <laughs> then you're like, What? It's not a cat. <laughs> then she's like, What what do you mean it's not a cat? <laughs> and she was like, It's a you know <laughs> in the form of a cat. Because it comes every single time. It comes and she sits she sits there, right? But she that's mischief la. It's a very mischievous creature. <laughs> so it will like like bother us and like catch our stuff. But but she she never fails to attend <laughs> the class. <laughs> so and and they come, they come and they listen. It's up to them. They can if they want to. <laughs> right, so you know, marhaban to all of them. Whoever they are, hopefully the angels lah, eh? not the other one. <laughs> okay, so we are on to Surah um, Lahab, right? Surah Abu Lahab. We finished Surah Ikhlas last week. It's not on the speaker for people who are like tuning in. I need to get my hands on it. I think someone someone recorded, right? This yeah, someone just recorded. I'll get my hands on them lah, and then put them on the speaker too lah. Because I I I recorded it, then when I click. Like like the stop button, the thing poop disappeared. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, because we finished surah ikhlas, and surah ikhlas is a very deep surah. We went a lot into our our belief, right? And how surah ikhlas is a uh, is a surah that um, actually uh, it it wipes out all wrong impressions that a human being or wrong all all the wrong concepts that a hum- they could possibly happen to a human being with regards to God, subhanahu wa taala. Right, so uh, just as a revision, lah, eh, right, because it's not on speaker. Right, as a revision about Surah Ikhlas. Right, so uh, the end of Surah Ikhlas the Tafsir. Right, we mentioned about uh, eight things. Right, whereby uh, human, whereby Surah Ikhlas gives us in our foundation, in our understanding of who is God and what is God, and what is what are the properties of God. Right, because human beings otherwise they will make up stuff. Right, that will be the. Uh, basically, that's not what God is, lah. God can't be as such, right? I mean, he can't be defined as God if he has these traits. So, uh, alright. So Surah Ikhlas. Let me just refer Surah Ikhlas. Eh? Alright. So the eight things, right? So the first thing, right, is that when when we says Ul huwa Allahu Ahad, right? So in the first uh, sentence, Ul huwa Allahu Ahad, right? It uh, refu- it refutes. The idea that God can be made up of parts. That's the first thing. Right? God being made up of parts is a idea that is that Allah refused by saying Allah is one. Right? So Allah is Allah and, and some of the some of the saints of the past, they say that when you say He is Allah, like Qul, huwa Allah, like Ahad, and He is one. He is Allah and He is one. Right? When you say He is Allah, your soul opens up. Right? Your soul is uh, uncovered. And you begin to understand the depths of this uh, meaning, this sentence. And you say, Ahad, then your heart is being uncovered. Right? And your heart is begin, beginning to think, right? And understand the entire reality of this existence. Right? So, say, Qul wa'allahu ahad. You know, the, the, the saints, right? They, they, they find this surah. It contains the secrets of the secrets, you know, or between a servant and his Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the first misconception Right, that Allah, uh, Allah um, nullifies in the surah is that Allah is made up of parts. That is by Him saying, "Qul wallahu ahad." Right, and the second thing that Allah uh, goes, that Allah nullifies, right, is that Allah is many. Right, so that one uh, is 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 also in the statement, "Qul wallahu ahad." Right, so that Allah is one, and even in that, Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, nah. The the tangga. penat is a tangga. <laughs> yeah, because no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Because yeah. <laughs> that day also I naik tangga, then they were like, "Do you rush here? No, it's just a tangga, je. <laughs> I didn't rush, didn't run, didn't do anything. Just naik tangga, je. <laughs> I'm panting already. 
Right, so so unhealthy. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Itu pun orang lain. Oh, right. So uh, so the second thing that it, this is a revision of of sort of a class lah. Right, for those who missed it last week. Right. Um. So adat adat meaning the number. Oh Lord is enumerated. He is not enumerated. He is one being. But he's one being without limit. Right? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that to us in surah, in the word uh, Samad. Allahu Samad. Right? Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad. Right? So, it, uh, and also to say Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, it already nullifies the concept of the atheists that there is, uh, when we say there is no God. So, if saying, instead of saying there are many gods, they say no God. Right, so Allah refutes that by saying, "Qul huwa Allahu ahad." Right, He is, you know, He exists and He is Allah, and He is one. So He's not made out of parts, nor is He. In you, He's not, nor is He, nor is He, uh, numbers. Like He's only one, one being without beginning and without end. That is the meaning of samad that we took last week when we went into the the word samad, right? Uh, and then the word uh, uh, samad, right, it nullifies the concept. Right in the human being, that God uh, needs. Right, God is in need. A nakas, a nakas meaning like he is uh, deficient. Right, you only you only in need when you are deficient. Right, if you are if you are alagani, you know, if you are self sufficient, you will never be in need. Right, so all creation, right, we are deficient. Right, because we are we're in need of things around us, we're in need of God, we're in need of all kinds of things. Right? So we know that this trait of God, that God is, God cannot be in need. Right? So for us to give God's uh, offerings, right? and then you know, you, you like God, as if God eats this, or God you know, consumes this. Right? That is not, you know, Allah, Allah refutes that. Right? Allah says that, that is not, uh, that is not possible in the, uh, in the concept of God. Right, God cannot be in need in any particular way. And that is uh, explained to us in the word Allah Right, he is, he is unlimited. Right, Allah is, uh, there is no limit to him and there is no need for him. He is not, he's not deficient in any particular way. In fact, he is perfect in, uh, in, in his existence. Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, and the fourth one, right, Al-Qillah. Right, Al-Qillah uh, bimana basaba. Right, so in, in the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, that, that he is uh, again like he has a similar meaning to to being uh, lesser right to have to being lesser right so that one has a similar meaning right that, so that in the word samad right to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above and beyond whatever we human beings can conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not he is not in need the lam yalid wa lam yulad, right? It shows another form of like uh, not a different form of of a need, right? Because a, a person who is uh, who who bears, right? Who bears children, right? or he needs descendancy, or he is born to, right? That shows there was a point in his life whereby he was needy, right? So or there was a point in his life whereby he was weak, right? So uh, so here there is Allah wa ma'alul. Right, that means to have a um, like a a a, a defect, right, a defect, right? Because we reproduce, because that means we're gonna grow old and die, right? That's why we reproduce, right? So uh, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, why in the world does He have to reproduce? He's not going to grow old and die, <laughs> right? And if, and to say that He was born, that means to say that you know Allah had there was a point whereby He depended on another being, right? That was in, impossible. Right, and if you all like watch all this Greek mythology about this like Hercules and whatsoever, right? I mean the concept of it in itself it is it's it's flawed. Right? How can God be stolen right, from his mother and father God? <laughs> Again, like like if they are already God, right, they, they would know their child is being stolen. Right? And then and then they're given some portion. And then those are just Hercules stories, right? Of of the I can't remember what the story about. But I know he was like a stolen baby god. <laughs> Right, and he couldn't, he couldn't uh, fend for himself, and even like, is that concept? What concept is that? Right, that is a human concept. Those are human beings, so those are not gods. Right, so Allah corrects that. that Allah cannot, you know, you cannot in a in a way uh, abuse Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and you cannot wrong Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I mean, in sense, you cannot hurt Allah in any way, right? But you can, like, you know, don't give Allah his rights. When you don't give Allah his rights, only you suffer. 
right not Allah Allah is in no need of us uh, worshipping him Allah is in no need of us doing anything for him right yeah, Allah is beyond that right? Allah is in of no need alright so that is number 5 and number 6 right Allah wa ma'alun right to have a defect and to uh, uh, to be born with defect or to have defect and this, is, this comes under the uh, under the trait of uh, being born right? or giving birth to Right, and then uh, right, it goes under a shabih wa nazir. Right, a shabih is basically uh, having something that is exactly like him. A nazir is some is basically having something that is similar to him, or in, in any way somewhat like him. Allah subhanahu wa taala, and we know this is completely impossible in the right of Allah subhanahu wa taala. None is like Allah subhanahu wa taala, and Allah makes it clear. Uh, nobody is in any way similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we see in surah ikhlas Allah clarifies eight concepts right of God that human beings have gotten wrong right so human beings have you know made up this eight uh, wrong uh, concept Allah refutes these things right? and he explains why this is so that Allah has to have you know be of these characteristics Right, because otherwise, in placing this, this other characteristics to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are basically ascribing weakness and deficiency to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, that is revision eh? Right, because many people missed out last week. The long, long talk last week eh? Uh, long class about talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so, uh, so we're going to move on to Surah Tabbatiyada. And Surah Tabbatiyada, right, why is this Surah coming right uh, before Surah Al-Ikhlas And this Surah came after Surah Al-Nasr right? And Surah Al-Nasr actually came Quite later on in the life In the prophetic uh, life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right? Surah Al-Nasr is one of the Surahs in, in Juz Amma In the last Juz That was actually revealed after the Hijrah Meaning after the migration to Medina right? Meaning it came much later on And Surah Tabat Syada here right? Surah Surah Masad Right, uh, it was revealed from very, very, very early on, right? When uh, the animosity, you know, of the disbelievers were very strong against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we're gonna see, right, for number one, and then uh, we will move from there. So number one is Surah Ikhlas coming into this surah. Right, what is the uh, link between Surah Ikhlas and this surah? Right, because this surah is basically a story. Of a, it's a case study lah. It's a case study, right? So if you see, if you look at the Quran and how we have gone, right? We've gone from Surah Fatiha, and Surah Fatiha, Allah lays the stage, right? Allah informs us about Himself. He gives us three ayat. He talks about Himself, right? And then He has one ayat whereby He shows how we are with Him, right? And then the last two, the last, uh, the last three ayats, sorry, the last two ayats, He ends off by saying that, uh, by 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 teaching us how to live our life in this world. Right, he chose us at three paths in this world, and then you choose the path that you want to go. Right, but at the same time, in your choosing, you need to make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to help you choose the correct path. And then we go into Surah Nas, Surah Falak. Surah Falak, Surah Nas come, just come comes together. Right, these two surahs shows the dependency of the human being on God. Right, that he needs God and he depends on God, especially for protection. Right, because there are things in life that we have no control over. In this dunya, like in Surah Falak, Allah mentions the dangers of the dunya itself. And in Surah Nas, Allah mentions the danger of the dunya that will destroy your akhirah. Right? And that is the shaitan himself. And this is beyond our control. We cannot see this enemy of ours. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us with it. Right? And so and for these two surahs, it bring us, brings our attention more to this God of ours that we worship. Right? And then Surah Ikhlas, Allah clarifies who is this God. Right? Because there are many human beings who do believe in God, right? and they do uh, seek protection in God, but they are looking at the wrong God, right? basically. Right? So they focus on the wrong God. So for Allah to teach human beings, how do you decide right, which God is the correct God? Lah, right? which, 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 which concept of God is correct? Right? So you look around you and you see the gods that other people worship. And you ask yourself right, these questions. Is their God uh, featured? Like, does it have features? Like, or is it featureless? Like, because God has to be without physical features because He created physical features. So He can't be of His creation. It's impossible for Him to be of His creation because if you have features, that means you are limited. And God cannot be limited. Right? We are limited in where we are because we are this physical body. 
So I cannot be somewhere else because I have to be in my body right now. Right? So, you know, for God to be to for God to be uh, knowledgeable of everything in any way and at all times, right? He cannot have this limitation that we human beings have. Right? So from there, Surah Ikhlas teaches us now you're getting to know this God. Right? Going backwards like in the Quran. You're going to know this God. You're, getting, you're turning towards this God. There are many people who do turn to God. Right? You see people running to their idols. They hold their idols. They they pray to the idols, they have their crosses, they have, you know, they have all kinds of things that they actually hold on to, right? And their concept of God, Allah corrects, right? That if you really want to worship God, find the correct God first, and right? the correct concept of God. And he uses this by a lot of rational thinking, right? To come to conclusion on who is the real true, one true God, it, acqui- it requires a lot of rational thought, right? and a lot of, you know, basically looking around, observing, thinking intel- uh, intelligently. Right, and then you arrive at this situation. So you know, Islam is very is very intellectual. Right? It is not uh like like they, they, it is not what you say blind belief. Right? It's not blind belief. Right? It is a belief through a lot of thinking. There's a the Quran. Right? There's a lot of verses that says, look around you, ponder, think. Right? But the moment you have arrived to the conclusion that God is as such, and then you see that the, the, the God that, that is described in Islam, or oh, it fits the description exactly. Like how how Muslims believe in God and how Muslims view God, right? And you see, okay, you know what? This is correct. Right? They view God to be unlimited. They view God to be all knowing. They view God to be all powerful. They view God to be the one who was there from the uh, who was there always. He was never created. He was just there. There is no beginning to him and no end to him. Right? So and he is the most merciful God. He's the most uh, loving God. Right? He is the most fair God. Right? So you know they go into the characteristics of God. That's why Akhidah is very important. The 20 sifat, learn them. Right? Learn them when. Right? What are the 20 characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn them well so you know your God. Right? Learn these names well. Right? So then, so now you are here. Right? Then maybe some people were like, you know what, at this point, like they're still not convinced, and and you hear this a lot. Like, what is wrong with me, not wanting to worship this God? Right? What is wrong? Right? What is the issue? Is it I'm not killing anybody? Right? I'm not hurting anybody by my disbelief, right? So here, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala demonstrates, right, the worst case study, right, of a kafir, right. So when someone refuses to believe. Right, Allah gives us a case study, and Allah does this a lot in the Quran. Right, and it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very effective tool in teaching. Right, when you're trying to explain a concept, right, to the to, to people who are listening, and they're just you know it, there is a stubbornness in them, or they don't want to accept what you are saying, you go into a case study, right? Because case study opens up the concept, and they can understand properly right, what you exactly mean. Right, this happens throughout the Quran. Throughout the Quran, you will see this from Surah Baqarah. Allah speaks about the three three human beings that that exist in this world, and so he goes in the case study of Nabi Adam, right? And then after that, he speaks about laws and 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 the need to obey laws. And he goes into a few things about Allah's creation, and then he goes into the case study of the Bani Israel, right? You know what's with these people? Right, they were saved from the from the from Fir'aun, and they cross the the river, they cross the sea. Right, and then they reached the other side, and then they took all their gold and they made it into a golden calf, and they began to worship the golden calf. Right, so you know, throughout the Quran, you will see concept, 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 case study. Right, understand or not what 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 has happened here? And then concept, 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 case study. Right, case study, case study, and then the sometimes that there are there are ayats, there are signs for you to reflect. Right, so although you know he's working with the intellect of the human being. Right, because Allah created the human being, and the first thing Allah revealed to the human being is that you know, Iqra bismi Rabbika ladi khalaq. Right, read in the name of your Lord who created. Right, so it's from the very beginning. It's all about knowledge. Right, you human beings were created with a mind. Right, you were created with a mind that is not like other creatures. You are not like other creatures. That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, karamna bani Adam." Right, we have raised the, the son of Adam to the highest of positions. Right, and but the what does the son of Adam do? He does stupid things. Right, he has been given this light of, of intellect. Right, but he does the most ridiculous of things with his intellect. He prays to stones. He prays to idols. He wastes his time. He walks around today. I don't know what was going on today. Eh? I I was at the circle line. 
the how lawa la ko tak lebih lawat. Like there was a group of people who were walking around in their underwear. And circle line, seriously, I I was like, oh yeah, Allah, what are they doing? <laughs> no, it's like some, men. yeah, men, men wearing briefs. Like, but they were wearing a shirt, but they were wearing briefs only. And then I think it was like some acting. Why? What's going on? But I didn't even check it out. <laughs> I won't pass. <laughs> I don't want to see what's going on, <laughs> right? Because I turn up, ah, can you walk down this escalator? It's right there on the station. And the escalator, what are his human beings doing? Like no man and a woman. Like right? there were women there who also like in their like lingerie, and they were wearing this kind of like silky. Something, I think they're promoting something, ah, but it's so. Oh, is it cosplay? Because I saw one guy at Bedok uh, in the chair just now. Why you see like a samurai? And then was with the sword. Oh, it's cosplay. What's that? Costume play. Costume. But they were wearing underwear. What are they playing about? <laughs> what costume, costume is that? <laughs> is it like what nightwear couple costume? <laughs> I don't know what it was lah, but I got the shock of my life. <laughs> Making circle line, you know. Luckily, like, like, I just, it was like one glance, then I just like, turn away, then I went to the end of the train. <laughs> they were in the train, and they were making a lot of noise. These grown human beings. <laughs> like, but, Allah, Allah, Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah. But, I mean, this is what, what it is. Like, Allah calls us to something higher. He gave us intellect. He gave us ability. He gave us so much, and then Shaitan is now in in glee, clapping his hands and saying, "You see lah, you see what they're doing. They're wasting their time. Like they're doing nonsense. They're 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 just you know fooling themselves. Right? These are the human beings that you made me bow to. Look at them. Right? So you know we're just like embarrassing ourselves. You know we're just making a fool of ourselves. Right? Uh, so. It, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, how do you get there? Right, but anyway, Surah, surah Al-Lahab, right, so Surah Al-Lahab, the human beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Right, so in Surah Ikhlas, Allah appeals to the mind of the human being. Right, he makes him think. Right, ponder, look around you. Like, ponder over this creation. This creation is so amazing. Allah has created and subjected to the human being. Right, this is the Quran. When you go to the Quran, it just, it expands your mind. Like you just get you, you, you feel your mind getting sharper and sharper and sharper by by you know being engrossed in this uh, Quran, which is the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And you have no time for anything else after that. Right? You just like this is so much. I'm like, mashaAllah. And then now, now Allah knows a human being. At this point, the stubborn human being saying, "What is wrong with me? This believing in this one God, right? What is wrong? Do I really have to subscribe to Tawhid? Must I believe in one true God? Is it necessary for me to believe in?" One true God. So now Allah pauses the entire discussion. He goes into a case study of the worst of the worst. And this is the worst case scenario right, of what could happen to a human being who chooses to disbelieve. Right? And that is Abu Lahab. And that is our story for today. Lah. Okay, so we're going to go into his story. We're going to speak about him. Right? And we're going to uh, reflect right, on why does Allah tell us about him. Because like, what is our business knowing about him? Correct. <laughs> like, he's in hell, khalas, you know. Like, but why does Allah make this into a verse? Because if Allah wanted to, He could just inform Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "Oh, your uncle is in the hellfire," right? And that would be it. it. Doesn't have to be a verse in the Quran. Right? It could just be, you know, a hadith could see. It could just be Rasulullah just knows that his uncle is going to be in the hellfire because, like, there were these believers whom Rasulullah just just knew that these people are in the hellfire. He just knew. Right? He was told. He was told who were the hypocrites. Right, so he is able to see things, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, so why, what is the, what, why does Allah, right, make it, you know, the story of Abu Lahab so clear, right, and vocalized and spelled out in the Quran? Right, why of all, because even Fir'aun, okay, his story is there lah, you know about Fir'aun. But there's so many lessons from Fir'aun's story. So many lessons from Fir'aun's story. Abu Lahab, which I'm like, very simple story. Right, Abu Lahab is destroyed, he's in the fire, his wife is in the fire. Right, there's a whole surah speaks about that. Abu Lahab destroyed, he's in the fire, his, whatever he has is useless, and his wife is also in the fire, they're all roasting. Right. So, you know, the Quran, you know, we know the Quran does not mention anything for no reason. Right, there are all, these all important things that Allah wants to be recited till the end of time. Right, so why? Right, so we're going to go into the surah, and then after we finish going into the surah, we will speak about 
why this surah is being placed here right in the Quran for us to recite right till the uh, uh, till whenever Allah subhanahu wa wishes for the Quran to be on earth right because you know towards the end of time Allah will lift the Quran right and the pages will be empty right there will be no more Quran on earth right and he will also uh, those who memorize the Quran they will die off right until there is no one who knows the Quran on earth right towards the end of time. Right, we all still got to our Quran, eh? <laughs> so we are not in that zaman. Yeah. Because you say that it's not so much the physical disappearing of the Quran, it's that lesser and lesser people know about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a uh, yeah. They're both both ways, ah. Uh. It can be both ways, ah. Uh. It can be people like it, the words disappear in the sense they disappear in their meaning. People no longer know about what they mean. Right, or it can also be a physical disappearance right, of the Quran itself. Uh, knowledge will disappear, and this from a Hadith Rasul Sallam. And he he that he explained. He said that it will not disappear, you know, whereby like the books will disappear. No, right? He said it will disappear because the ulama will die off. Right, that's how knowledge will disappear, not pass down. Right, they will just die off. People don't want to learn anymore. Right, so and there there were, there was a there is um. She Abu Bakr bin Salim, right in Tarim, right, who one of the greatest, greatest saints in Tarim. He was very knowledgeable, right, and he said that uh, before he passed away, lah, he said that you know that I am passing away now, right, and there is like you know how many hundreds of types of subjects is in my that's in me that I never got to share with the people, right. So he placed his secrets and his knowledge in in the like wherever, wherever he is buried, lah. Right, so, so it's basically like people, you know, they they have so much that they have acquired because they just dwell on the Quran and they and Allah gives them knowledge, right? But just the the people are not taking and the people are not asking. Nobody asks me about this knowledge, right? And I don't know, no, no one to share the knowledge with, right? Towards the end of time, lah. Towards the end of time, right? There are many interpretations. Alright, so so the first thing, right, in how Surah Ikhlas relates to Surah Tabachada, you understand? Right, so Surah Ikhlas is the highest of ideals, the highest, highest thing a human being can engage in, which is uh, to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to understand the oneness of God subhanahu wa ta'ala, just to, to wrap his mind and, and make himself a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the worst, now is like two, two spectrums, eh? right? So the worst of worst, right, Abu Lahab. What is his issue? About this Abu Lahab, alright. So this surah Tabachada Abu Lahab Watab, right? Uh, surah is is called surah. They they have many names for it, right? Surah Tabat from the first word in the surah, right? And the Sahaba they used to do that, right? They used to just name a surah by just the first word, <laughs> right? That's all, right? So it's it's called sometimes Surah Fatiha is called Surah Alhamdulillah. Right, because they because of Alhamdulillah. <laughs> right, so it is called Alhamdulillah. Uh, like Surah Sajda, they will say is Surah Alif Lam Mim Sajda. Right, it's the Alif Lam Mim. There's a Sajda in it. Right, in that one, that Surah. Right, so then they just call it by the first name that's in the Surah. Right, sometimes it's called Al Masad. Al Masad is the last word that's in the Surah. So sometimes surahs are also named, right? Uh, like, like surahs in the Quran, like, surah ikhlas has a lot of benefits. So the names of surah ikhlas goes under the, be- I mean, it comes from the benefits of surah ikhlas. Other surahs usually is named by by a word that is unique to that surah. So the word masad, right, it is something that is that, that sticks out right, in this surah. Right? It's a very unique word in this uh, surah. So like for example, surah nahl. Surah Nahal, Allah speaks about the bee and the honey. Okay, so it's very unique in this surah that Allah spoke about the bee and the honey. There's Surah Nahal about the ant. Uh-uh, and in that surah, the story about the ant. Right? So, they, so they name the surahs you know, in accordance to what is the most prominent thing right, that, that is mentioned in this particular surah. Right? This surah was revealed in Makkah, of course, right? because Abu Lahab uh, did not uh, live for very long. Right, he did live till the migration. Yes, till the battle of Badr, he lived, right? and then he would die a gruesome death. And he will go into the gruesome death of Abu Lahab. Right, how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, disgraced Abu Lahab. Right, at the end of his life. So this surah, right, it was revealed because of an occasion that happened in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, I will first go through the entire story of the surah, then I'll go into the verses. Right, this is how I'm going to structure it because it's, it's this surah has it ties a lot with the seerah, right? Very, very strongly tied to the seerah, right? Uh, the, the, the biography of Rasulullah, right? And then I will go into analyzing why how this surah uh, is applied to our time, right? Our, our day and time, all right? So, the story of this surah, right? right? How why was this surah revealed, right? So, so Rasulullah, when he first got his got revelation. 
right? and he was 40 years old right on the on the on the in the cave hira on jabal nur right he ran down and he went to his wife in the khadija right and she was the first to believe in him right and and she and his daughters right because they, both their parents are muslims automatically they fall under being Muslims. That's so why you'll never hear of uh, stories as, uh, mentioning when these daughters enter Islam. Right? They were automatically under their father. Right? So automatically when the father and mother are Muslim, they're all Muslim. Right? So the moment you know he got his revelation, that is what Habib said, they were Muslim by default. Lah, by default. So uh, Sayyidina Ali saw Sayyidina Khadija and also some praying once. In the same day itself, right, they were praying. And he asked them what were they doing, right? and they explained to him, and he became Muslim straight away also. Sayyidina Ali is the first boy, young boy, to become Muslim. And then also some told his best friend, which is Sayyidina Abu Bakr, a Siddiq, right? and Sayyidina Abu Bakr became the first man who became Muslim, the first grown man. Right? And then uh, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he was a very strong tool of da'wah. Right? He would go around, right? but it was all still in secret. He was taught all in secret. So whoever Sayyidina Abu Bakr would see that he has some potential, right, to actually embrace this message, he would inform them. Right? And of them was Sayyidina Uthman. Sayyidina Uthman was one of those people who was who became Muslim by the da'wah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Abu Bakr called Sayyidina Uthman into Islam. Right? Sayyidina Talha. Right? Uh, so these are people whom, like, Sayyidina, under Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Ubaidah. Right? So they're the, the, the big, 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 big sahabas. All of them came into Islam by Sayyidina Abu Bakr calling them to Islam, right? So Sayyidina Abu Bakr, you know, his, his reward, you know, is the reward of each of these big sahabas. Because whatever they did after coming into Islam, all their rewards doubled up in Sayyidina Abu Bakr's account. You know, he's like, he's, he's, he's major, major reward that's going on. This is Sayyidina Bilal said, you know, what am I except one of the deeds of Abu Bakr? Like I'm just a, a, a deed of Abu Bakr, that's all I am. Because Sayyidina Abu Bakr freed him. You know, he brought him over and then he freed him. So Sayyidina Bilal would be like, I'm just a deed. I'm just a good deed when it comes to Sayyidina Abu Bakr's account. That's all I am. Right? So, and most of them were like that. Right? Sayyidina Abu Bakr was, was, was very crucial in calling this up. But this happened for three years in secrecy. Right? And there was a re- there was a, there is a wisdom right? why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed three years for the calling to Islam in secrecy before Allah commanded Rasulullah Islam to go out in the open. Right? And this and the and of and of the wisdoms, eh? Why these three years of secrecy? So it's a bit of Sirah today. We're gonna go a bit of Sirah. And we're in a bit awal, so we should just love to hear about Sirah eh? and just hear all the stories lah, eh? right? So it um Sayyidina Muhammad. So the first three years of secrecy, right, the first uh, wisdom Right, why these three years of secrecy? Right, is so as to form, right, a, a critical mass of Muslims, right, of believers before it was proclaimed. Because can you imagine it being proclaimed immediately, right? And then the, all of this rejection and opposition and you know, uh, like like violence is going to happen against Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It would turn away potential believers. Right, so in secrecy, it's easier to believe, because you're not being judged, right? You're not being harmed, and no one knows about what you are actually believing in. It's a secret thing, right? So secrecy it pulled in the stro- the the, uh, the crowd, right? But it was in secret, right? So so you had like like quite a number of Muslims lah. In the first three years, right, they would all gather in Darul Arqam, right, whereby they would hear verses of the Quran uh, being recited onto them from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the first uh, wisdom. The second wisdom of the three years of secrecy, right, of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right, it is uh, also to to strengthen Rasulullah sallallahu himself, right, strengthen, right, because he's about to, he, you know, he's, there is a struggle when it comes to receiving, receiving the revelation. There is a difficulty, like a heaviness that comes with. Receiving revelation. So he can't be struggling with this and at the same time facing his society that is against him. Right? So to get the just get the hang of it, like, eh? the hang of revelation, right? Just to get the revelation coming in, right, and to be okay with it and be having okay with angels coming to you all the time. Right? Uh and, and the prayer, right? So basically it is the forming up of the personal religion. Right? Of faith in his own self, it is forming up. He's still forming up. Right, so uh, of course, I mean, his faith has been there since he was, uh, you know, born, right? But you know, the the practice of Islam, right, to be firm, right, before actually 
going out because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows in his infinite knowledge right, that the people will definitely oppose Rasulullah sallallahu and they will do so violently. They will be very aggressive about their opposing Rasulullah sallallahu their opposing to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He, the one is, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. And so if you go from the first, from the first day when the revelation was revealed, and, and if it was made to go out there and call people to Islam, right, that can be very, very stressful on to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on the new Muslims. So even if Rasulullah is strong enough to carry it, the, not, the new Muslims are not strong enough. Right, so they need the three years to become, to strengthen, right, uh, before they actually, uh, they, they actually and, and to fall in love with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before they actually uh, face opposition, right, from the disbelievers, right. So these are the of, of the wisdom that the ulama have mentioned, right? Uh, when it comes to the three years of secrecy. So now we're coming to the surah, right? And now Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is given the, the he's given the the command, right? And Allah sallallahu says, "Wa andir ashiratakal akrabin," right? And go and warn your close family members, right? He was, you know, he's given the 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 instruction. So immediately, and this is how Rasulullah Sallam is, you will study Sirah, whenever any command came to him, immediately he would get up. Then, then he won't even like wait, say, okay, I'll do tomorrow lah eh. No, no, he won't even, you know, do tomorrow or do later or do at night or, you know, wait lah, wait lah eh. I'll do it, I'll get around to doing it. No, no, no. The moment the command came, he would get up and he would do it there and then. Right? And he will say that even when he went to Medina, the command for jihad came. Where right, Allah sent down the verse of jihad right, to fight them. And he actually walked out of Medina. Right, and the verse came, he walked out of Medina by himself. Without an army. Right, and he went to, uh, to, 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 to fight some, like there were like those uh, caravans. Right, to intercept lah, the caravan. Right, because they, they stole all the stuff from the Muslims when the Muslims left Mecca. We'll, that one I'll go into when I go into the Sirah. Right, well, basically, the, the records were that he worked out, of, he uh, worked out only one time, a few times. He walked out of Medina by himself with his sword and his armor, and nobody else. <laughs> right, because of his strong obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gave the ayat that say he walks out of Medina, he looks for, you know, uh, to defend the Muslims. Right, and then <laughs> nobody with him. <laughs> right, so, mashallah, Rasulullah Islam immediate. Immediate obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he walked out of his house, right, and he went to Jabal Safa, right, the mountain of Safa. That is near the Kaaba. It's one of the two mountains that you will run between, uh, in between them, right, when you do your sign. Right, so you run from Safa to Marwa, Safa to Marwa, back and forth. Right, so he, so, and it is the custom of the people at the time that whenever they have something important that they want to announce, it's for them to go to this mountain, mount it, Right, and then call the people. Right, so and whenever anybody does that, the people would know, oh, there is important news to be revealed. Okay, so he did that. Right, so he went to the mountain of Safa, which is the castle of the people at that time, to announce important news. Right, and he shouted out, right, to the people. Right, so he will, uh, he, he first shouted out, you know, like, like, uh, uh, like, oh. A uh, family of so and so, old tribe of so and so, old family of so and so. He called the tribes by name to come and listen to him. Right, so and people know that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, he's not a person who would who would usually do so. Right, just to announce stuff, you know, randomly on the mountain. He's not of someone who would usually do, do so, and he was a very respected member of society, a very respected and also believed member of society. So he began calling all of these people. So even people who were at home who couldn't come at that time, right, they would send somebody from the house to go and hear what is the news about. Right? So it was a very serious thing. Like everybody came. It was a big crowd. They came around and they gathered around Rasulullah SAW on this mountain. And then Rasulullah SAW said, right, Oh my people, right, do you not see that if I was to tell you right now, if I told you right now, there is an army behind that mountain over there, right? That is waiting in ambush, about to attack you right now. Would you believe me? Would you believe me? And they said, of course we will believe you. Right? You, for you have never lied. Right? You are, you know, you, you have been amongst us all these years and we have never known you to lie. And we know at this point, Rasul is 43 years old. At right? three years after revelation, he's 43. So he's a, a very well-established member in society. People know him. 
but he's a known person in society right so they say we, we have never known you to lie ever not in your childhood not in your youth not in your ever the whole society you know it's, it it takes a lot for you to be nicknamed the the truthful one in society right for you to actually gain that nickname that means your your truthfulness is extraordinary it's not like normal people's truthfulness, right? It's so, you know, it's so extensive, right? It's so extraordinary that you actually gain a nickname, right? Sadiqul Amin, the trustworthy, the truthful, right? So it's something that is not, it's not you know, common in society to just name someone that unless they have exhibited extraordinary form of, forms of trustworthiness and truthfulness, right? That is not like normal human beings, right? So... So the, the fact that he had that nickname onto himself, right? It was was a known fact. This man, that is is impossible for him to lie, right? That like, you know the the moon would split and the man would not lie. You know, like this man, he just he can't lie. He just cannot lie, right? So they said that about him, and he and he repeated this thing a few times to make them say it a few times. That of course we we'll believe you, you never lie, and then he said, "Well, my people, for surely I am a warner sent to you." I am a warner sent to you to warn you of a terrible punishment that is coming. Right, so he, he begins by that, right, because the, the analogy lah, right, that there is an army that is waiting for you. So now I am a warner, you know, that, that, uh, to, from God, and he says in his, in his statement, from God the Most High, right, the only God, there is no partner unto this God to warn you of an upcoming punishment. Right. And some of the Sahabas, right, some of the companions of Rasulullah they said that when you know, what made them believe in Rasulullah Wasallam was that we have never heard him lie about anything in this world. Never ever in our lives heard him lie about anything. So why would he, if he's about to begin to lie, why would he begin to lie about God? Right, if he's never lied about anything in this world, right, why would he start with God? And start lying about God and saying, God gave me this, God said to me this, God told me that. No. So, so like, of course, he, when it comes to God, all the more he will not lie. Yeah. Right? If he doesn't lie about the dunya, why will, he be, why will he be lying about God himself? Right? So when he said that, Abu Lahab, he stood up. Right? And we know Abu Lahab is the uncle of Rasulullah Wasallam. Right? To understand the gravity of what Abu Lahab did, right? you must understand society at that time. Society at that time, your family is your everything. Your tribe is your everything. Right? Family back up family. Right? So it is, you know, it is something that so and even if your family is doing something completely wrong, like completely like ridiculous, you don't go against your family. Right? That was the culture of the time, the society at that time, whereby family is number one. Lah. Tribe is number one. Like the like loyalty to tribe, pride in tribe, you know, you you, you defend your member to, to your death. That kind of thing. That was the kind of concept they had in their society. Right? So, and we have to understand that because what Abu Lahab did right, was really, you know, uh, disgraceful. Right? And it was so ugly as an uncle right, to do that in front of everybody who was there. So, Abu Lahab stood up and he said, Tabban lak abihada jama'atana Right, so Abu Lahab, he stood up and he said, and he cursed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, it's, like, it's, it's basically to, to put it in our context, right, it's like somebody, you know, who's trying to, who's, who's speaking in front of a huge audience, right, and his own family member gets up, right, and he says a very bad word against that person. That's what Abu Lahab just did. Right, so, you know, just to disgrace your, your, your own family member. Right, and even more disgrace because it came from a close family member. Right, that is that, that is why you know what he is 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 terrible, right? Completely ugly and disgusting is Abu Lahab, right? Because even if you're against what your what your nephew is doing, you don't have to humiliate him in front of everybody else, right? And 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 have this kind of words come out. Like if it's really a few in the Arabic language, like it would be like a very terrible thing to say to anybody else because tabban here means. May you be completely destroyed, completely and utterly destroyed. Right? So it's a very bad, you know, curse onto someone. Right. So tabban lak abihada jamaatana. Right. He said, you know, may so he stood up and he said to Rasulullah, right, may you be completely destroyed, right, and be brought and be brought low, 
What's the meaning of tabban? Huh? Like lah, like, like, like a curse lah. Like you know, like I don't know what they say in our culture lah. But basically a curse. Like on to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is this, is this what you call us for? Just this? Like you know, may you be destroyed completely. May you die lah. Like it's understand like you will say like you know, someone like you know go to hell or go to you know like go and die ah that kind of thing. Ah, uh, like waki ya. That's what he did. Abu Lahab. All the Rasulullah did was <laughs> like look at the, the the contrast. All he did was call the people, nicely tell them, do you believe in me? All of them agreed they believe in him. Then he said, I am a warner unto you, out of his concern and his love. And Rasulullah is doing this with full conviction that people will follow him. He was actually fully convinced that people will follow him. Right? Because he's never lied to them and they actually honor him. The people actually honor Rasulullah Wasallam, Right? So he never expected that kind of backlash and from somebody so close, his own uncle, who was not just his own uncle, he was his neighbor, in fact. Abu Lahab was a neighbor of Rasulullah Sallam, and on top of that, he was the father-in-law of his daughters. Because Rasulullah's daughters were wed to Abu Lahab's sons. So they were connected in three ways. Right? And, and despite all of that, when you come up and then you do such terri- a terrible thing in front of everybody else, right? to just discredit Rasulullah Sallam wa alayhi wa and when he said that, the people dispersed. Right? They just walked away from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There are other stories about Abu Lahab did, right, with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because Rasulullah sallam, there were other instances whereby he would focus on his direct family, so his cousins, his uncles. He would invite them. Also, there was there's an incident whereby Rasulullah sallam invited them, and these are all the efforts of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in in calling his people to the truth because he had sincere love for his people. And he could see them, you know, tr- destroying themselves, throwing themselves into the hellfire. Right? He could see them leading very terrible lives and leading towards a terrible afterlife. So out of, you know, complete, you know, purely, pure concern and love for his people. There was once he actually uh, had food and he had like a banquet. And he invited all of his close family members to come, right, uh, for the banquet. Right? And Abu Lahab, it's even maybe after this lah. And Abu Lahab kind of knew, right, what Rasulullah's uh, intention was. That he wanted to do da'wah to these people. So he called them to the food, you know, and he served them and everything. And everybody was uh, basically having a good time, right. And then before the banquet ended, Rasulullah wanted to begin his speech to, do, to call them to Islam. Abu Lahab made a lot of noise. And he was like, oh, go home, go home, everybody, just go home. We are done, right? done eating, right? Okay, go home, go home, go home, go home, go home. Right? And he like, you know, make everybody get up and go home. And left, you know, all the food there, all eaten. Like, in that, that in the Arab culture is such it's terrible manners. Even our culture, pun, eh? you don't come to somebody's house, eat all their food, right? Make a lot of noise and leave the mess there and go home. Right? That is not, you know, what what we actually do. Right? We actually, you know, at least we try to try to like, like, like clean up a bit, or you know, at least put your plates away, like, that kind of thing. Right? But terrible, terrible behavior. So Rasul, you know, and his kindness, Rasul, it shows. He did it again. He prepared food <laughs> again. He called his family again, right, for uh for for a meal. Right? But this time he's gonna speak before the food ends. <laughs> right? So you know, like mashallah, he's so gentle. Like for us, you're like oh, poor, nah, like, so frustrated, ignore stupid uncle. Eh? <laughs> you be like you be very like like not if that one uncle and don't invite him lah. Eh, for invite him kan? Right. So uh but he invited him still. Because he's the uncle. Right? There was still an invitation towards uh, Abu Lahab after all that he did. So you see, his character, he, he, he responds to, to terrible behavior right? with goodness. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, he called uh, his family everything, right? and then he began to talk to them. So he began to preach them, right? saying that he's a messenger sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call you to goodness, to the worship of the one true God. Right? And it's all gentle, gentle preaching to the people. And then he said, and who will support me? Right? Who will be with me? You are my family. And that is the culture of the people at that time. We are family. And we support one another. And we don't go against one another. Right? So when he did that, like everybody who was present, they just kept quiet. And nobody did anything. Right, and then Abu Lahab again. He got he got up and he began to make fun of Rasulullah SAW. Right, that, uh, you know, saying that you know, nobody will support you of his family and nobody will be will 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 will, will be will, uh, will 
will support you lah in any way. And when he did that, right, Sayyidina Ali, he got up. Right, and Sayyidina Ali said, and he was a 10-year-old boy. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I believe in you and I support you. <laughs> right, so Sayyidina Abdullah began to laugh. A 10-year-old boy. Right, that boy, he's going to support you and believe in you. Right, he began to laugh and they all, began, and they all dispersed. Right, so you know, these are stories like that. They happen. In Rasulullah some time. So Abu Lahab did this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in what he did eh, against, uh, against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah retaliated. And Allah then, then Allah sent down the ayat. Where Allah says Tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab. Right, Allah curses Abu Lahab at this point. Right. And we'll go into the verse. Right. So Allah says Tabbat yada. Right, so tabat again the same word that Abu Lahab used against Rasulullah. Right, maybe he be completely destroyed. So Allah said, no, no, no. Right, Abu Lahab, right, he is the one who is completely destroyed. Right, so the first word number that's number two, right, tabat. Right, so number two, the tafsir there is that Allah uses the same word that Abu Lahab used, and Allah afflicts it onto onto. Abu Lahab himself, right? So and that is how curses work, right? There is a hadith that says that if a Muslim curses another Muslim, right, this curse will go up, right? To this, the, 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 this curse will first. If you curse another Muslim, right, this curse will leave your mouth. It will go to that Muslim first. If the curse finds that that Muslim is not deserving of your curse, right, that curse will go up to the sky. Then it will circulate the earth to find somebody who is deserving of that, of your curse. And if you can't find anybody, and usually you can't find anybody, it will come back to the one who said it and afflict that person. Right? That is called cursing. So if you, it's like cursing is a terrible thing. Don't curse people. Right? So if you call, curse somebody to go to hell, something that, it's something that is very common in our community, to say go to hell. Right? That is a terrible, terrible thing to say to anybody. And I have heard even like parents say to children, Right, are you seriously making a dua to your child to go to hell? Right, that is such a terrible, you know, or go and die. That kind of thing. You know, like, like why do people even say these things? Right, just, you know, just, just, salawat lah, do something. You know, stop, stop it with these bad words. Right, and all of these words, they, on our account there, eh? all the words on our account. There was one scholar, right, who was mentioning that, you know, on a day of judgment, we don't know how many people when they search, if, if everything that we say is alphabetical, can, and they search under the letter F, and they find a full lot you know, of pages full of curse, curses. Right? And there are people who are like that. If, you're going, if you have gone through secular school and you've gone through JC, eh? right? in JC, it's like, like uh, part of their... Uh, part of their zikir, right? right? In JC, seriously, when I was, I've never heard it used so much, except when I was in JC. I was like, it's, it's like every sentence is punctuated right, with, a, with a curse word. I don't know why. Like, why are JC kids like <laughs> that? Right, I mean, alhamdulillah, university, I didn't hear it that much. Maybe I, I moved away from those that crowd. Because JC is, is, is a small, small classroom sizes. Maybe in university, you get to choose your own friends. <laughs> right. But JC is terrible. Right. Secondary school also, like, it begins there. The age. Right. The age, ah, the age. Yeah. But, but it's just so... Impressive. To be so impressed. That's the way of impressing, right? It's really powered by expressing. Yeah, but it's so. In control. <laughs> you know, it's, but it's so filthy. Like, it's not, so not to filthy. Them, the words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they always. Yeah, I don't know. What is going on? Why is everybody using that? This, this, this. It's. Yeah. It's, 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 about, it's nothing to them. But all of these things, all of them your book, eh? <laughs> it goes into your book of leads. All, every word that you say goes into your book of deeds. Every word, you know, to Taubat of all those words. Now, now it's, it's terrible. Yeah. But I, I just never liked it. Like, it just makes my, my skin crawl. Like, it's like, it's yeah. also the, the look that you mix around. Mm. Right? Mm. You yeah. are who you choose to be with. Yeah, right? your friends <laughs> in JC. Yeah, uh, right. So, uh, there is thing about curses, right? So Allah is demonstrating here. This Abu Lahab, he cursed Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah sent the curse back to him, right? 
and he and Allah says tabat so yada. The second thing that we have here is yada, the two hands. Right. And why does Allah focus on the two hands of Abu Lahab? Abu Lahab is mentioned by name in this surah. So there is no doubt that this surah is definitely about him. No doubt. Because by name Allah mentioned him. And we're going to see why Allah mentioned this name. Because Abu Lahab is not his real name. His name is Abdul Uzza. That's his real name. Right? Abu Lahab is just his nickname that the community has given to him. And it was a nickname that he used to take pride in. He loved that nickname of his. Right, so I'll go into why he's called that lah. Right, he this is nickname of his. Eh? Right, so uh, uh, so so um, why the two hands? Eh, so and Abu Lahab he used to make fun of his verses. So so this Abu Lahab is interesting character lah. He when the verse came down, he got very angry, like that. You know, oh my nephew is going around cursing me. Right, what's wrong with this? You know, and the Muslims whenever they see Abu Lahab, they will read the verse. <laughs> When they see him coming, they say, Tabat, Yada, Abi, Abi, Tab. Right? They always go on with the verse. Right? And Abu Lahab gets so angry, frustrated with the Muslims. Right? But there was, you know, but there was a time where Abu Lahab would be like, You see, my, my, my nephew, he says that my hands are destroyed. My hands are fine. He will like, My hands are fine. I don't have any destroyed hands. I have fine hands. My nephew has no idea what he's talking about. Right, so he would go around doing that kind of like nonsense like, eh, and, and, uh, and arrogance. But towards the end of his life, he will be afflicted with a disease. It will afflict his hands. And then the rest of his body, he will rot while alive. He will begin to rot while alive. And eventually he will die in that rotten state. Right, and because he will begin to rot, and it was, a very, it was it's described to be a very disgusting disease that Allah afflicted him with. And then the whole of the, of, of the community, they, they basically isolated him because they were scared that it was contagious. Right? They were scared that the disease was contagious. Right? So they were actually, they, he was isolated. Right? He was basically repelled by society. Right? And he died in that state. Right? And nobody bothered to bury him right? because he was so disgusting and they were afraid of a disease also. Lah. Right? So, but eventually he was so smelly. His rotten body was, you know, his rotting flesh. Lah. Right, so eventually they, they it was said that they, they they dug a very big hole, right, and then they used a stick from far and they push the body. Right. They push, push, push into the hole and then they they, they threw sand into it. Right. Just because it was, the stench was too terrible, they couldn't die on the stench. Right. That was the the, the, the end of Abu Lahab. Right, disgusting. <laughs> Abu Lahab disgusting. He did not go out to, to fight in the battle of Badr. He was too much of a coward. Right, the battle of Badr claimed the lives of many of the terrible disbelievers in the time of Rasulullah SAW, but not Abu Lahab. Right? Abu Lahab was too terrified to actually go out and fight. <laughs> too coward, he was cowardly, lah, eh, Abu Lahab. So he did not go out and fight, he paid somebody to do it for him. So he paid someone to fight on his behalf. Right? But Allah afflicted him. Right? Uh, and we'll go into the story lah, of Abu Lahab. Said. So basically, he used to do it. Lah. He said, My hands are fine, my nephew has no idea what he's talking about. Right? And here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he focuses on the hands because the hands are the ones are the main limbs that do evil deeds the hands right the main limb right that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Yasin uh, Surah Yasin وَمْتَزْ جَوْمَا إِنَّ الْمُجْرِمُونَ أَلَوْا أَحَيْنَا لَكِمْ يَوْنِي أَدَمَا تَمُشَتَانَ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ مَعْدُهُ بِنْ وَعَنِي عَبُدُنِي هَلَا سَتُ مُسْتَقِيمُ وَلَقَلْ Right, so here Allah says that on, on this day right, On this day We will seal their mouths uh, And their hands begin to speak Right, so their hands begin to speak because the hands do a lot of nonsense. Right, their hands do a lot of sins. Right, so the hands begin to testify against the human being. And the feet, they are witnessing because the feet are usually there silent. The feet, you don't, don't engage in the sin. But the feet bring you. The feet brings you to wherever you are going to sin. So the feet are the ones who are watching. What are you doing where, wherever you have gone? Lah. But the hands are usually the ones that are involved in the sin. So when Allah says uh, that his hands are, are destroyed, of course Allah means the entire of Abu Lahab is destroyed. Right? Because you can't put just his hands into the hellfire and his whole body is safe. Right? His whole, the whole being of Abu Lahab is destroyed. 
That's what it means here. Eh? The whole being of Abu Lahab is destroyed. Right, so tabat siya da abi lahabi watab. Right, watab at the back. Right, is basically an emphasis. Right, so you know the the hands of Abu Lahab are destroyed. Right, and oh, it's such a complete and utter destruction. It's really destroyed. Right, there is no way. Right, for for any form of rectification for this man. Right, meaning this man is a conquis. Right, con that sit. He's in the worst parts of the half here. Right, because of what that he has done, and this surah did not make Abu Lahab think, it did not make Abu Lahab repent, it did not make Abu Lahab scared. Right, in fact, just made him more angry. Right, and the ulama they they they, they comment, right, they say that you know if Abu Lahab had you know just a bit of intellect, right, <laughs> this Abu Lahab when you read about his story, right, he seems like a very like very much like a like a pretty boy who is not thinking very much. He's not very smart. Okay, he's very you know. <laughs> Very frivolous, right? In 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 his ways, I will see. About, I will speak about him a bit in a bit more, right? So the ulama say that this Abu Lahab, right? See Abu Lahab, right? This ayat came down very very early on, about the third year of prophethood, the third year. Abu Lahab he would live right up till the Battle of Badr, which is in the thirteenth year or fourteenth year of prophethood. So for a good ten years, good ten years, eh, he was alive. This surah was being recited. So the ulama say that actually Abu Lahab, if he had even a fraction of intellect, right, he could have just faked being Muslim, right. And when he faked being Muslim, there is a very one thing that will undermine the Quran, because now if I say Abu Lahab goes around and say, oh, you know what, I say I should Allah Allah, I should Allah Muhammad Rasulullah, and I'm Muslim. You see, the Quran is supposed to be eternal. It's supposed to be true. But I'm Muslim and the Quran says that I will have fire. How is that possible? The Quran is wrong. Right? And if he had thought of that, because he had, he had 10 years to do that, <laughs> and the, then him just doing that would undermine the Quran completely. Right? Because now you have declared to be Muslim, and as a Muslim, I'm supposed to be in, in, in paradise, what? Right? Right, but the whole ten years, it never occurred to him even one time to pretend to be Muslim, ever. <laughs> yeah, and that is a proof for us that the Quran is the word of God, because you know Allah can say in the open, you know that you know this you will be in a hellfire, and for ten years it didn't even occur to you to tawbah or occur to you to even fake being a Muslim. You already. Uh, uh. I, I, I watched the uh. I watched um, Omar's story. I feel that that movie uh, really get, gives a very good reputation of the, what happened. You know, he made a very good idea. Uh, so apparently, the reason why uh, he did not want to give in was because it's too much pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's too much. You know, the, yeah. the classic thing that you said just now, yeah. and then the pride that they had. And he's a, he is of a you know, higher status, so to speak, in that mm-hmm. community. So to admit that he is wrong and then, you know, give it to Muhammad mm-hmm. is. It's like dying. Yeah, but it's actually not admitting. It's actually undermining. Undermining. You see, uh, the idea here, like the ulama is saying, is that uh, it's not so much to, to embrace Islam, it's to pretend to embrace Islam to undermine the Quran. Uh, uh, maybe his, his mind doesn't reach that level. Lah. <laughs> uh, to fake it. Uh, yeah, but it will be a very strong uh, argument against the Quran. It's a very strong argument if he had done so. Uh, yeah. See, the Quran is wrong. Ah, uh, but but you know he's 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 because the ulama thought about it. Because even the ulama thought about it, he could have done that, right? And that will be the number one way to to break Islam. If he really you know is is he's animosity against Islam, right? The f- strongest way to break Islam is to break credibility of the Quran or the source of Islam. Neither thing they can break, <laughs> right? Because Rasulullah is completely credible and the Quran is completely credible. So to break credibility of Quran. You can do something to show the Quran is wrong. And he could easily have done so by thinking to be Muslim. Yeah. He could have easily done so. Yeah, it is his ego. Yeah, it is his ego. That, and also that he... Of course, for us, it's proof. Right? It's now it's proof that this is the word of God because Allah can say whatever he wants to say. Right? It's true till the end of, till the end of this world. Right? Nobody can change what Allah has said. Right? Uh, that's why it's, for us, it's proof for 10 years. 
you know he didn't even have any idea <laughs> came to his mind nothing and in fact it came to the minds of the muslims at that time that for as long as he's alive he can actually you know do something to break the credibility of the quran right but he didn't it didn't occur to him <laughs> it just didn't occur to him <laughs> huh yeah but it's you know like yeah What up? When do they? Emphasize the the destruction lah. Is the same word as tabat yada, tabat and watab, same word. Ah, uh, so like Allah repeats the same word right to emphasize, right? What? Yeah, completely destroyed, right? So or it can also mean that and he has been destroyed. He is destroyed at this point in time, right? There is no no there is no hope for this for this man. Right, okay, about Abu Lahab and his name. Right, Abu Lahab is called Abu Lahab, right, because he was known to have a very beautiful reddishness in his face. To the Arabs, right, it was a sign of beauty, right, it was a sign of handsomeness, a sign of beauty. He was a very rich man, right. So this reddishness in his what was in his face, right? Uh, Lahab means flames. Right? It means Lahab, flames, flames. It means uh, reddish flames. Right, so like he had rosy, he had rosy, he had rosy cheeks, lah, rosy cheeks. Right, but for men to say rosy, rosy cheeks is not like in, to the Arabs very macho. Right, it's not a macho thing to say. So they say you know inflamed, right? So he was the father of flames. Me, he had nice red cheeks that brought out beauty in him. So he was very good looking, lah. And right? they said he was very very good looking. His wife was also very beautiful, and she is called Um Jamil. Right, the mother of beauty. Right, so they were very beautiful people, very rich people. Right, they were somewhat like celebrities in, in the society. Right, but they were not respected members of the society even before Islam. Right, in a sense, they were not looked up to for their wisdom. They were not known for their wisdom, unlike Abu Jahal. Abu Jahal was known for his wisdom. Right, Abu Jahal was called Abu Hakam before Islam. Right, because he was known for his wisdom, he was known for his intellect. People would would would, would uh, go to him for advice. Abu Jahal, eh? <laughs> uh, uh, Walid bin Mughira also, Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid's father, he was also known for his deep wisdom and deep thinking. Right, so but he also disbelieved. Right, so all there also there were people in society whereby they were leaders, right, and they had good qualities like of of leadership, of uh, wisdom, of basically societal. Um, Concerns. Abu Lahab was not of those. Abu Lahab was just pretty, right? He was very rich. He was obnoxious, right? So he was naturally not a very liked person. Right? He's very even the disbelievers didn't really, they really like him very much. Right? So he's he's dead lah. He's dead, right? That's what what he was. His wife same thing also. Vanity, uh, beauty, money, richness. She has all her her jewelries and everything lah. Right, basically they occupy themselves with these things. This is what they were, right? Allah did not use the original word of the original name of Abu Lahab because his original name is Abdul Uzza, and Uzza is an idol, right? So the the slave of an idol, right? So Allah did not taint his Quran by that terrible name, right? He's called so we have Abdullah in our in our religion, Abdullah, Abdul Rahman. The slave of Allah, the slave of, of the most merciful, Abdul Latif, right? The slave of the most uh, gentle, right? So we have these names for our, for in, in in Islam for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So you're the servant of that, of the of the God that we've property. So in that time they had those names, right? But it would be like Abdul Uzza, right? So the slave of the idol lah, right? That's what it is. Uh, they have like Abdul Kaaba also they had. Right, the slave of the Kaaba. Right, these are things that they all used to have in, in the time of uh, before Islam. So, uh, so the name was not used because it would taint the Quran. Right, Allah did not want to to have that name in the Quran. Right, uh, and the name is also used because Abu Abu Lahab used to take very much. He used to be proud of this nickname of his. He loved his nickname. So Allah used his nickname, right, and then twisted the nickname at the end, right, because he says that Lahab, right. So he's the father of flames. Yeah, because he's deserving of the flames, right? Of the eternal flames. So Allah, you know, he, in a sense, uh, he's being uh, like Sindela in a way, like Abu Lahab, right? Because you love his name so much, yeah lah, it's for you, 
Ah, uh, the pun intended ah, uh, pun intended. Ah, <laughs> pula hop, pula hop, right? You know, you you are you are there, right? Because it's the terribleness lah, Abu Lahab. Okay, of what Abu Lahab used to do, eh? In the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was it? Okay, so we mentioned a few stories of what he used to do, right? Of more than that, right? When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to go out and da'wah to people, so now you know after the first three years, he would actually go to groups of people who are still around the Kaaba. Or you know, during the hard season, he will go out and he was he will just da on the people. Abu Lahab, right? As if he has nothing to do with his own life, he would follow Rasul Islam everywhere he went. Like a shadow, <laughs> very annoying man. He would follow Rasul Islam everywhere he went, right? And whoever whoever Islam sat with, right, and spoke to, Abu Lahab would shout out. Oh, don't listen to that to this man. I am his uncle. I know he's crazy. He's a crazy man. He's a liar. He's you know. So the uncle is now really like undermining everything. Every effort Rasul is trying to do. This uncle follows him like a shadow. <laughs> That's why annoying, kan? So if we think we have it bad, you know, you have not seen Rasul's life. Like you don't have an uncle going around breaking your credibility wherever you go, right? I mean, if you had that, there'd be an issue in the family, can? My uncle keeps going around telling everybody that I can't do it, that I can't make it. I'm, I'm a, I'm a useless person, <laughs> right? That's what he used to do. Uh, uh, this Abu Lahab, everywhere, no? everywhere, right? And and people will listen to him because they oh, it's the uncle. The uncle knows more than the nephew. The uncle would know. An uncle never speaks about speaks against his nephew. That's their culture. So for him to speak against, that means the nephew is really terrible. That's how they reach the conclusion. Because the uncle speaks against the nephew, so the nephew must be a real liar. This nephew or a crazy person or possessed because the uncle is saying all these things. Like they say, Abu Lahab by name, eh, by name, is being mentioned. Although he's angry, right, with with the deeds of Abu. Lahab, right? What Abu Lahab has done, right? So, uh, right, and and also, okay, they always speak about his wife, eh? Right. So, so, uh, we tabat shada abi Lahab wa tab. Right. Second line. Ma aghna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. Right. So here, Abu Lahab. Right, he goes. He goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam once. Right, and then he said to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, he said to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, uh, what will I get when I be, if I become Muslim? What will I get? Right, and Rasulullah sallam said that you will get whatever the Muslims have been promised. And then he said, uh, my my wealth and my and my children." Is more than what the Muslims have been promised, right? So Abu Abu Lahab, eh? right? And then he said, uh, and then he says that you know, and may you be cursed of Muhammad. Do you think I'll ever enter a religion whereby I will get as what the people get? You know, I must get more, <laughs> right? So his arrogance, ah, arrogance, right? I will not debase myself to be like the rest, right? Ever, I will not be like them. I have to be special. I have to be more. I have to be more rich, right? And there's another reward. But he says that whereby Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, whereby when he was cursed into the hellfire, right? He says, okay, when I am thrown into the hellfire, I will just bring all my money and my people, right? They will bail me out, right? So that's when the verse came down. Ma aghna anhu ma luhu wama kasab his money, right? And what he has earned, the kasab here they say his children. Uh, basically, whatever he has earned, right? So whatever he has, like none of it will enrich him in any way. None of it will help him in any possible way. And of course, because Allah is the one who gives him everything. Allah is the one, you know. Allah doesn't care if you come with the whole world. And in the Quran, Allah says that if the disbelievers come with the entire earth and what is in it, right, to to build themselves out of the hellfire, you will not build themselves out. They can't. Because Allah created the earth, <laughs> why would Allah need you to give Him the earth, right? So it doesn't make sense. Again, concept of God, right? Concept of God completely mis- messed up. Right? I can bail myself out in front of God. Like, are you serious? <laughs> you break it, building yourself. Out. God does not care for money. God does not care for wealth for your children, right? God, you know, He is His God. Right? He cares about good deeds, 
right? And about not doing terrible deeds. Right. So it uh so that's why the verse came down. So ma agna. So agna. Why does Allah use the word agna? Right. So agna meaning like because you know he he thinks that he is rich. It's Abu Lahab. Agna from the word ghani. Ghani means rich. So he thinks that he is rich. So Allah is saying your wealth and your children they are not signs of richness in any way. These are not richness because he used to make fun of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also, right? When 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 Rasulullah lost his son, Sayyidina Qasim, right? No Sayyidina, Sayyidina Qasim, Sayyidina Abdullah, Sayyidina Abdullah, his uh, last son from Sayyidina Khadijah, right? Uh, Abu Lahab being a neighbor, eh? neighbor, eh? he heard about the death of Rasulullah's small boy, right? He was one plus before he died. And Abu Lahab, when he heard this this news, he clapped his hands in glee, and he went around, right, shouting, right, and, and laughing that Muhammad's son is dead. Muhammad's son is dead. Right, even the worst of your enemies won't do that, lah. Eh? Even terrible, you know, as as bad as an enemy you are, you won't you won't be gleeful over the death of a, of a child, even if it's your enemy's child. Right, so it's, that is the the neighbor, the nephew. Right, family member, right, going around already. Rasul Sam is feeling the pain of losing the child. Sayyidina Khadijah is feeling the pain of a child dying. The family is in grief, right, and you have this uncle of yours. It's like what? This this neighbor, he has no heart whatsoever. Going around rubbing it in your face. Ah, your son died. Your son died. Your son died. I kind of like terrible, terrible. Person and it is all recorded. That's what he used to do: go around and laugh, and then and keep pointing at some saying, "No son, no son, you have no son. Your sons are all dead. You are cut off, right? You know, like really, you like want to strangle this guy, right? Like what is wrong with him? But that was how he was, lah. And 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 when you talk about really trials with family members, eh? <laughs> we have no trials with family members compared to what Rustam is getting from his uncle. Right. So uh, ma agna. Right. So Allah is redefining what Abu Lahab defines as richness, which is children and wealth. He has children and he has wealth. Rasulullah Sallam to them he does not have children because he has no sons. To them daughters are not children. Right. To them lah in that culture, right. Daughters are basically burdens. That's all they are. Right. They are not children. Sons they are children. Right, because sons help you out, sons earn money, sons, you know, uh, basically, you know, they 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 are wealth lah to them, and right? they benefit. Daughters have no benefit whatsoever, right? This is what the people of that time, that was their mindset lah. That's why they, it was chivalrous to them, chivalrous eh, to bury their baby daughters alive, right? That was chivalrous. Right? It was something uh, they were proud of. It was something that they would boast about. That they killed their baby girls. Right, it's such, a, and that is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is teaching us that this belief in God, right, this belief in the, in the higher authority, right, can lead human being down a very ugly road. Can possible, right, and and not all human beings. We don't say all human beings, but that's what Islam is about. Islam speaks about the weakest. So there are human beings. They are not going to be good natured. There are human beings who are not going to be good people. They are. They exist. Without laws, they will do terrible things, right? So Islam came, right, to to stop these terrible human beings from hurting themselves and others, and it came to elevate those who are naturally good, right? There are those who are just kind-hearted, uh, to elevate them higher and higher and higher to become the best of human beings above the angels. As you see, religion, you know, that's why altruism doesn't work because altruism only works on those who are kind. There are, there's plenty of crooks out there who are not kind. Right? If not for religion, right, they will do terrible things. It is what we are seeing today, lah. Right? There's no religion. They 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 harm children. They kill children. Right? They I read articles are about this kind of things, lah. They have like islands. If you know if you all read before, islands. The rich and famous, eh, of of the West. They own small islands where they keep children there. Children, children are born into these islands not knowing anything at all, right? And they are basically treated like animals in these islands by these rich and famous, right? Huh? Abuse, lah. 
So all these kids know is a life of abuse. So they don't know what the world is about. All they know is this island that they live in, and that these crooks, right? They go there every day, right? And they abuse the children, and this and to them is normal. Now, yeah, now. yeah. It's an article about it. I read about it. Right, it's it's a dark secret of the rich and famous. Right, and they are they're discovering this. So the the children they will and they make the children reproduce. They have more of the children. Right, this is the the worst of worst of humanity you have. And these are like people. And uh, I if I find the article, I I was like, oh no, no, God, yamulki It's satanic. It's satanic. It's terrible because they reproduce the children like like animals. They reproduce them right? and they use them as as how they want to use them lah. Right, and these kids have no. They have no concept of a proper life. They think this is what life is about. Uh, they don't know anything else than that. It's a people all over the world. It's under the hands of the rich and famous. Right, they are controlling this. Right, the politicians. They are. Yeah, so, so even in England now, they resist now naming streets after their politicians because there are those streets that they have named after, and later on after they die. They find out the secret, and now they have to pull it, pull back the name lah of you know this person being a, uh, what do you call it when they, uh, no 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 no, um, in England lah what do they call it ah uh, sir or when this when they, what's it and they knight someone and they knight someone right and then they find out after their death that these are crooks, and despicable disgusting crooks. Right, so the religion, <laughs> accountability in the next world, right? All of these things, you know, because they are terrible human beings, they exist, right? That's why our law teaches us about laws, about rules, because maybe you don't have, don't need the rules, but there are people who do, right? So blank blanket, everybody follow, everybody must follow, right? Because otherwise, they will destroy other people, right? So it. Uh, and Abu Lahab is one of the examples, eh? <laughs> right? Abu Lahab is one of the examples right? of of crooks. Eh? Abu Jahal is mentioned later on. Inshallah, we read Surah Alaq. That that person in Surah Alaq is Abu Jahal, but not mentioned by name, right? But who Allah is speaking about in in that story of in the Surah of Abu of of Alaq, Surah Alaq is Abu Jahal, and and the irony is that Surah Alaq begins with knowledge, and Abu Jahal is to pride himself of being knowledgeable. And being full of wisdom, he was called Abu Hakam, the the father of wisdom, right? And the surah begins with knowledge, and it goes into this person of ignorance, right? The the extent of ignorance, Abu Abu Jahal, right? Inshallah, you go in there, you will study lah. What is your take on some views of Asatiza to say that the Quran was revealed to the Arabs because the Arabs were the worst of the kind? Uh, that's the reason why it was revealed to the Arabs. To wake them up, to teach them a lesson. No lah, I don't think they were the worst of kinds because this is the whole of human society all over the world lah. Right? There was uh, there was drunkenness, there was fornication, there was sins. It was rampant lah among human society even up to today, can mm-hmm. ah. Uh, but but what I've learnt of why the Quran was revealed to the Arabs was because the Arabs. Right, they were people of uh, memorization, one thing, and they were people who were of uh, they were people who were of principles. So they oh, never. Oh, yeah, it's actually the opposite. Yeah, because I have heard of a couple of Asatiza who you know, tell us that you know because the Arabs were the worst of the kind, they killed the babies and everything, and then it's all over the world killing babies. I was thinking of also because. You, not just, not among the Arabs, but among the Chinese who also no. like uh, girls, yeah. among the Africans who also don't like girls. Yeah, it's all over the world. Shaitan yeah. has done his job. Yeah. But even the China, the one baby policy, they used to kill their girls. They used to check to see that, what well, if you're going to have one child, let it be a boy. Yeah. And they were farmers. They For them, it's serious. It's a serious matter if I have a girl. You know, who's going to help me on my farm? <laughs> Right, so the China one child policy, you can look into it. Right, there were a lot of uh, killings of girls, eh, right, because of the one child policy, right, uh, which is you know, and even up to today, abortion is rampant everywhere. Abortion, abortion, abortion. 
it's, it's sad lah that human beings have come to such a state, right? That you that we are, but it's not that's, that's not the reason, right? And actually, I disagree strongly, right? Because uh, the the reason that I that I learned lah when I learned Sira, right, was that the Arabs they were of memorization. They heard something they memorized straight away, very strong memorization, right? So they were to preserve the Quran. Second thing, they were people of their word, right? So they were they were principled in that way lah. So if they gave their promise, they are not. Uh, they don't they don't back out on their words and they're not treacherous in any way. Right? The, if you look in the Sira, you don't find the disbelievers being treacherous. You find the Jews being treacherous. And the Jews promise something and they go against it. The disbelievers promise and they all honor their promise. Right? So they had this thing in, in, in amongst the Arabs as called Dhimma. Dhimma meaning if I if someone is coming into Mecca and he has my Dhimma, that means he has my name. So nobody can harm him because my name is on him. Uh, and the, the believers and the disbelievers will honor that. They actually will honor that. Right? Because that person's name, you know, you, I have my name on him. So some had that also. When he entered the Mecca uh, after Ta'if, he was being stoned and he feared for his life. So he, on his way in, he met a non-Muslim who was a sound non-Muslim. Right? But he gave for some his dhimma. So they announced, Muhammad is under my name. And the non-Muslims respected that. They respected. They did not harm Rasulullah. So the Arabs are people of. They were people of. They have this pride, right? That we don't break our promises, right? Uh, you know, we when it comes to war, a great battle, right? That means we don't, you know, uh, uh, ambush or whatever. A great battle, right? So I will tell you that we coming. We coming to war. They have. They have. They kind of like. We got, there's a pride lah. There's a pride that like we don't uh, do sneaky things. We're not sneaky about about this situation. No, we have pride, right? So, yeah, there, there's a pride in the society, lah. That is, and when it comes to promises, they don't. I mean, it's uh, ugly, lah. The people, the person who who breaks promises, right? He, uh, Allah alam. I can't remember exactly. Okay, but there were good disbelievers in the time of Rasulullah SAW. They existed, right? They minded their own business. They didn't really get involved, right? But majority of them would become Muslim when Mecca is conquered, right? Then the majority of them enter Islam, right? Inshallah, uh, Masira, Asira. There's a lot of lessons in Sira. A lot of lessons, especially when it comes to dealing with non-Muslims, right? And also the all kinds of things, lah. Okay, we'll pause there. صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم الفاتحة الله يرزقنا الأمة النافعة وعمل الخاص المقبول ويهز التعني مدلل على هدى وسلو بذلك قلب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وإلى أرواح المعالمين ومشايخنا وذلق علينا وإلى أحد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان الذي خسر الذين آمنوا بسوره حتى توسوا بالحق توسوا بالحق سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين